See, when you gave your heart to Jesus last week, we talked about knowing God. You came into a relationship with Him, salvation. Sin was separating from you from having a relationship with Heavenly Father. You lifted your hand, you received Him into your life for what He did on the cross and that He had risen again. And you came into this whole journey of getting to know Him. And so salvation and, and, and knowing Him is all about, it's about that. It's like a, a heaven or hell issue. It's a saved or not saved issue. But when it comes to freedom, because our discipleship pathway in life, our church is know God, find freedom, discover a purpose, and make a difference. And we're just walking our whole church through it. Whether you're kind of already making a difference, it doesn't matter because you need to learn some things and help and direct other people through that whole thing. Helping people discover and find Jesus and then helping people find freedom. Now, when it comes to freedom, it's not a heaven or hell issue. It's a quality of life issue. Come with me, team. Just with the slides, that'd be good things. Freedom is not a heaven or hell issue. It's a quality of life issue. To live in freedom, we have to confront and take responsibility of what's gripping your life. What's gripping your life? Have you have got old wounds? Hang-ups? Destructive attitudes? Walking in disbelief? Is there something in your marriage that just hasn't been resolved? What's, what are those things in your life that are holding grip of you? You know, I even had chatted with somebody and they came up to me and said, James, I don't really know if there's anything I got to deal with. <laughs> it's like, hi. I go, this would have been awesome. And I go, are you sure? <laughs> and then he says, well, when I think about it, and then he just starts crying. You know, I didn't do that because, you know, they're going through something. And then he just started to share what, what is. And I go, well, that's, that's what God wants to free you from. So thank God you're in the right environment. Position yourself so that Holy Spirit can reveal. Because that's his job, right? That is his job. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, 10, and 11. I know I see no ears, heard no mind, has conceived what the Lord has uh, for those uh, who, who love him, but he reveals it to those in whom he loves and he reveals it by his spirit the spirit that searches all things even the deepest things of God's heart so it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit's job to reveal these things within your life so that you can deal with them so to live in freedom we have to confront and take responsibility of what's gripping your life it's going to be hard confronting some things I mean, anyone walk through that before having to confront some things about yourself? No, some people haven't. Or you're just lying, or you're just not free to put up your hand. Your, your own pastor is putting up your hand. Yeah, man, I've, just, I've been there. So scared of confronting the ugliness that I saw. Not so much looking in the mirror, but looking in my children. Not because it was them, but because they were reflecting what they can see in me moment when I'd have an outburst towards my wife and then I'm, I'm not looking at my wife's condition I'm looking at my condition through my wife and pride is what stops us from dealing with hang-ups and barriers and hindrances that the devil has kept us bound by so the devil would love to keep you to keep us distracted distressed and depressed Love to keep you in that place. Love to position you there and keep you positioned there. Why? Because as long as you're distracted, you'll never see what God wants to do. You'll never be able to do what God wants to do. If He can keep you distressed, you're just going to be on this high red alert that all you have in your life is just, it's constant drama, 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 drama. Well, Pastor James, you don't know my life. Okay, I get that. I might not know your whole life. I might not know what necessarily happened to you. And by the way, just because uh, I'm not saying you need to take responsibility for some of the things that have happened to you, because some of the things that have happened to you, friend, was not God's, God's love. The way He treated you, the way she treated you, the 
way some people have treated you. Maybe it was a pastor. And on behalf of those... Those silly mistakes or intentional things. So from a pastor, if you've been hurt by one, I'm sorry, on their behalf. Well, James, that's not enough. I don't know, it's part of the process though. So, the devil would love to keep you distracted, distressed and depressed. First John chapter 3, verse 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil was, has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God, Jesus, appeared was to destroy the devil's work. If the devil's work is to keep you distracted, distressed, and depressed, it's Jesus' work to bring you life and life more abundantly. No more depression. Depression is not who you are. It's not your identity. God does not... He did not create you. And He was designing you with depression. I know it's real, friend. I know it happens. I've experienced it. I've experienced it even as a pastor. Where my personal life, financial life wasn't going that well. Church wasn't even going that well. My marriage was just a little bit rocky. And I got so angry and so frustrated. that The only place that I could be was to find myself coming to church. So I came to church. I I parked my car up around the corner so no one could know that I was at church. I had the blessing of having the key to church. So I get in, I lock it. Nobody knew I was there. And I hid in the corner in the foyer. Before we had upstairs, there was was a bigger foyer. And I hid in the corner and I just started to cry. The only thing I knew to help me deal with is position myself to get free. So the place that felt more comfortable in that season of my time was here in church. So I hid myself in the corner. And the other thing that I did was just play worship so that that worship could play around me. And I wasn't wasn't allowing my negative thinking patterns to determine the quality of my life. Even though I felt the pain, felt the distress, felt that depression creeping over my life. And through that worship, we had this um, wall in, in the foyer. It was made out of pallets and it was actually wasn't supposed to be up because it wasn't fire retardant. So we had to actually pull it down. So it was a good excuse for me to relieve some pressure. So I went back into my car, got all my tools out and I started smashing this wall down. Pulled it all down and I felt like I was smashing. Oh, I felt like I was smashing some things, some lies in my life. I, I, I was smashing down some walls. I know what it's like to feel that low, but it's not who I am. For I am a child of God. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. This is Jesus speaking from the prophet Isaiah. He's reading it in front of all the people in church, by the way. To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim what? For the what? The prisoners. Somebody say prisoners. And the recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. Have you ever seen the word stronghold in the Bible before? And when you see the word stronghold, sometimes it can describe an actual fortified city. But in spiritual terms, it means so much more than that. And it's detrimental to your life. So the word stronghold, the Greek meaning for it, watch this, is prisoner locked up by deception so when there is a stronghold in your life it means you have been imprisoned and locked up by the deception that you have been believing about who you are about who God is so are there strongholds in your life? probably God, Jesus came to break down those strongholds it's funny eh, when you look when you, when you start to see lies and, and lies are like a reinforced bars on a prison. One lie after the other. I was helping a, I had a, a, a man uh, approach me and um, I'll protect him for this, but I'll, it's a good example. And we, 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 we went through his, he wanted counseling. I said, just come see me first and then you can, we can find you a counselor. 
And, and then uh, I said to him, just tell me about some events in your life. And he told me about one particular event. So we wrote down that event. We put it on a yellow post-it. And, um, and we went for all these events. And then in blue post-its, I said, under all those events, I want you to write down those negative emotions and negative impacts that it had on your life. And so under each event, he started writing all these blue post-its. There were heaps of them. I said, those are all the strongholds. One of them was guilt. One of them that he thought he, he believed he was dumb. That he was weak. This is him writing it down. It was just a few days ago in my office. He starts writing down all these lies. And these lies became strongholds in his life. Fortified. So no wonder it's hard to be intimate with somebody. No wonder it's hard for you to touch your husband. And I'm not just meaning physically, but intimately. Because there's strongholds. And you can touch, you can kiss. <laughs> but you lose the quality of life because there are strongholds standing between you and others. You and your dream. This is why over time it's hard to see your dreams because you're trying to navigate through all of the strongholds and lies that have distorted your vision and you're wondering, well, I'll never be able to achieve that. But Jesus came to break down every one of the devil's works. So this man, I said, hey, why don't we just deal with one of those events? And that one event had guilt to it. It was his grandma. Nice, just really nice. <laughs> You're right, bro. You're doing good, brother. Tom. There was uh, just one who sits there, and it was guilt. And it was with his grandma. And when he was young, his grandma got diagnosed with cancer. And in, in his innocence, he thought that you could catch cancer by hugging the person which we all know that that's not true at all. But in his innocence, he didn't know any better. And he thought, I don't want to hug my nan anymore. I love her, but I don't want to hug her anymore because I don't want to catch cancer. So he didn't. From the time she was diagnosed to the time she passed away. This is when he was 12. But now he's 28. And so... I said to him, let's deal with the event first. Have you ever said sorry to Nan? Have you ever asked her for forgiveness? But she's dead, James. It doesn't matter. I said, you can ask for forgiveness right now. I'm sure your Nan has probably already forgiven you. In fact, you told me she was a woman of faith. And he goes, yeah. I was like, bro, she's happy as G. But you believed the deception from 12 to 28. And that's why you're a prisoner locked up in deception. You're not guilty. So I said, Nan, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I didn't hug you. I'm sorry I didn't embrace you. I didn't know anybody. And he starts pouring out his heart. And I gave him the yellow post-it. Rip up that event, brother. He rips it up, chucks it in the bin. And he says, but that blue post-it, that guilt still sits there. And it's all right. I'm going to leave the room, I told him. I'm going to play some worship. Like, what I want you to do is I want you to replace all those lies with all the truths about what God says and who God says. And so I left and come back. And all of those lies are ripped up. And then he's got all these truths. You know, friends, it's really important for you to understand that a stronghold is anything that exalts itself in our minds pretending to be bigger or more powerful than God. Just pretending. It's not true. He's just pretending. And I need you to understand this, friend, that the devil has power but has no authority. He's got power. Uh, it's, just, it's in the Bible. It's just, he's got some power. Well, how do we know? Well, it's been working on you. It was, work, it was working on me. 
And that's why they kept me so bound because he, he's got some power, but he has no authority. Last time I checked the Bible, I checked that I had been given authority. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, as a believer, Jesus says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So now it's time for you to walk in your God-given authority. Lift up your head. Carry the manner of Jesus. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It is not you, it's Christ in you. But it's in, in Him, in you, that He tries to transform your identity. So I said to the brother, I said, the reason why, he said, I, 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 I wrote down these truths, but how come I still finding it hard to believe? And I said to them this, I said, strongholds over a period of time become part of your identity. So when you were at age of 12, for some of you, it might be even younger. You're believing these negative lies. Your dad told you, ah, you'll never achieve anything. Man, you're so dumb. But I've heard parents call their kids dumb. In church. And, that, and I've seen them reinforced. So something that happened to you as a child, you were innocent. It was out of your control. You couldn't control any of those things. But that negative impact had a negative emotion attached to it. And it became a stronghold. And over that period of time, those strongholds become your identity. What does that mean, friend? Well, it means these strongholds once were like this. I, I will never be clever enough. It's a stronghold. And over a period of time, they then become your identity. What is that? I am dumb. It was a stronghold, but over a period of time of reinforcing the deception that the devil lied, we started to believe him, and then it became our identity. And we're wondering why we're still behind this prison. And Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to break those barriers loose, to free the oppression off your life, to free that deception off your life. And that's what we're going to do today. I say this to people all the time. What follows the statement, I am, follows you. I am, fill the blank. So you can say, I am dumb. What's going to follow you after a period of time? You're just going to feel dumb. You're going to tell everybody you're dumb. You're never going to do give anything a go because yeah, I'm too dumb. What follows I am, follows you. You know, Satan's ultimate goal, Satan's ultimate goal is to keep you from being effective. He wants to stop you from being that good. He wants to stop you from perform, not performing for Him or for His love. But stop being effective in this world, in your life. Stop you from having pure enjoyment, life, happiness. So here's the question, friend. So how do we break free from these strongholds? How do we live in freedom? I'm going to give you three areas in your life that can help us in this journey of freedom. Those three areas are relationships. I've named the second one, be hot. We'll get there. Don't worry about it. And the third one, simply the Holy Spirit. And if we practice these things, you'll start to see freedom in your life. Let's go to the first one, relationships. We say in the life of our church, you've heard us, you've heard Joey annoyingly say, Pastor James and any one of us say, life was never meant to be done alone. It's because we believe it. Life was never meant to be done alone. You and God is not effective enough. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Did you just say that? Yeah. You and God is just not effective enough. It's a good start. But you, God, and some trusted people. You really have success living out your faith and exercising spiritual freedom if it's just you and God. Really. Having community is important in our process of living in freedom. You know, in, in a community of believers, this is why I love church more than I love preaching. When I say church, it means people. This is why I love gathering with people. Like I, sh like I, I love sharing food with people. 
not sharing my food, but sharing food, eating food. You know, no, just joking. Learn and grow together. That's why I love it, because we get to learn and we get to grow together. We get to experience God's grace together. My marriages are so much, is so much more effective because I'm doing it with her. I'm learning with her. I'm growing with her. I'm experiencing God's grace even in the most difficult times together. Even when we're not, when we're at each other's throats, so to speak. That God's grace is still there and we're learning and growing together. You know, it's interesting because confession to God brings us forgiveness of sins. But confession to others brings us healings. It's all scriptural. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, it talks about the confession to God brings for the forgiveness of sins. But in James chapter 5 verse 16, confession to one another, to your brothers and sisters in Christ, brings us healing. So if you need healing from the past, you cannot do it without having the community of people in your life. So there are four crucial choices when it comes to relationships. There's one thing I can tell is that you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Come on, man. Come on, man. When someone's walked into our church before, ministering to them, doing pastoral care, one of the first things that you can see is that, bro, you need to change your mates. I was like, bro, you, you, got, you got negative mates? Okay, how many people lost friends just because of what's going on in this nation? Because they disagreed with what you, what, you, what you stand on. And what I love about our church is this church ain't anti anybody. We're not anti people. That's what I love about this church. Actually, we're all for all people. We're, all f- we're for people. One thing I have learned though is if you're getting very aggressive with someone else, it's not because they got a problem, it's because you got a hang up. So confession with one another brings healing. So you show me your mates, I'll show you your future. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19 in TLB. Look what it says here. Look, man, watch, watch, and read it. A mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the kinds of friends he chooses. Oh, let me take it a bit further. Let me take it a bit further, right? If your, if your wife, give me an example. If your wife is not what you desire or what you believe even is what God desires, I have found that the majority of the time is because the husband is not doing his job properly. Now, most, most people don't want to agree with that. And I was like, but it's true. You could tell what a good husband is by going and talking to his wife. Any of you can go talk to my wife. You can ask her any questions because I'm already open and honest and transparent with people anyway. You can just go talk to her. Ask her. She'll tell you some undesirables. But she'll, she'll also tell you how great of a man I am. How good of a man I am. You can go and ask my, see, that was her. Come on. You can even go and ask my daughter what kind of father I am. She'll tell you the truth. You only have to look at the people you surround yourself with to see what kind of person you are. So let me give you four things, four crucial decisions, choices that you need to make that are going to help you make uh, strong relationships. And through these relationships, find freedom. Okay, here we go. Number one, nurture your important relationships. Nurture them, nurture them, nurture them. Now, let me use the analogy of a fireplace. We use it for marriage and sex, right? Marriage is the fireplace. Uh, uh, sex is the fire. When you put that fire outside of the fireplace where it doesn't belong, it impacts and affects and hurts other people. Okay? I don't have uh, enough time to dive that we could spend one whole session on that. It's this, but where does, where does sex belong in God's eyes? In the marriage, in the fireplace. So in the fireplace, what does it do? It brings comfort. It brings warmth. It creates a beautiful atmosphere that people can enjoy. Not so much the sex, but the intimacy. Amen. It's the same thing with your relationship. Your relationships that you have, your important relationships, they're their fireplace. Now the fireplace doesn't make people cold. The lack of stoking it does. Stoke your fire. 
So if you want your relationships to thrive, are you stoking it? Are you investing into it? Are you, are you, what are you putting into it? Are you adding value to them or only taking from it? What are you doing to nurture those important relationships in your life? What are you doing to nurture your marriage? The second thing when it comes to crucial decisions is restore broken relationships. This is a powerful time. This is a powerful moment. I've, I've, I've spent my life, I'm only 30, oh gee, I almost forgot how old I'm. 35, 6, am I 36? Hey, I'm 36, damn it. Anyway. <laughs> I've spent my whole life from understanding the importance of this. First was with my dad. Then it was with my siblings. Then it was with people throughout my whole life. Ex-girlfriends. People that I've just had to restore because I didn't realize I had hurt them or they had hurt me. You know, one thing I've discovered is that pain of unresolved conflict is far greater than the pain required to resolve it. If you can be brave and courageous to resolve it, it's going to be painful, but it's not as painful as not resolving that conflict. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Do not repay any evil for evil. Be careful to, watch, uh, to, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Verse 18. If it is possible, listen to this, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. you know, I'm just standing for my rights. And if you don't like it, I'll be yours. And if you get offended with me, well, sometimes it comes out of an attitude that you don't want to live in peace with them. You're coming from an attitude that you want to have one up on them. Peace might seem peace might look like this. I can have my opinion. I just don't have to ram it down somebody's throat. And I can accept their one. And that we can learn to disagree, but agree. And we can still walk in peace. That's how your marriage lasted this long. <laughs> it's true, man. Your marriage is full of disagreements. Only to come back in love and still agree with one another. You walked in here with a disagreement. I'm just, I'm not saying that you did, but you know, your wife didn't text me. Okay, it's all good. Okay. And this, so one beautiful thing, when you go to choose to restore, you can choose to, when you choose to forgive, you hand the matter over to God. What does this mean? It means you may not necessarily have to confront the person that you need to restore with, but you definitely have to restore it. You can restore it between you and God and say, God, I forgive. God, I am so sorry. God, I just forgive you. You can name that person. I forgive you right now because you might not be ready to actually confront them right now. Holy Spirit might lead you to do it at one point. But one thing I've learned is when you have chosen to forgive, you hand the matter over to God now. It is His to have. Uh, you know, what if my dad didn't say sorry back? What if he didn't receive my forgiveness? What if he got angry because of the things I had against them? And I already made a decision when I say my bit, I can walk away knowing that the matter is now in God's hands and I'm leaving it up to God to deal with Him. Thank God that it didn't happen that way. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Number three. The fourth crucial thing when we're making relationship decisions, know when to walk away. There's gonna be a time well, you really need to walk away. By the way, this isn't permission for any distressed married couples today to walk away after this. Okay? That is the devil. Do not listen to him. Okay? Here's the reason why it may take some of that though. For some people, it's because it's destructive and it's harmful to you. And there is no way of you being safe or being able to have a quality of life. So you do need to know when to walk away. My mum knew when to walk away. She felt bad about it. But God had to restore her and he's still on the journey of restoring my father. But 
let me put this towards you. You can choose to sever it, the relationship, or you can choose to redefine it. Which one do you need to do? One thing I do believe is that you still need to restore it. So restore it, but after that, you could choose to sever it and walk away, or you can choose to redefine it and see that the grace of God could rebuild it. First Corinthians chapter 5, 15 verse 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company, man. Hang around enough bad people, enough people that are just like just so negative or, 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 or reminding you of who you were or, or keeping you into that, that narrative or even that tall poppy syndrome trying to keep you down, but you believe God's taking you to greater things and trying to um, break out of some things. That Bad company corrupts good character. Here's a hint for you. If it hinders your relationship with God, then you have to choose to sever it or redefine it. Because any relationship in your world that hinders you from getting closer to God, being more effective in God, is a relationship that needs to be either severed or redefined. Some of us in this room need to redefine our marriages. Some of us need to sever some relationships. You need to come before God. And if it hinders your relationship with God, then you have to choose to sever or redefine. And the last four crucial decision choice that you need to make is risk being real. Risk being real. Take a risk in having intimate and initiating meaningful relationships with one another. Take a risk, man. Take a risk and write some nice little lovely notes for your wife. Just do it. Don't cook because you can't cook, but just at least write, write a good note. It's not hard to be a person of affirmation. Just give it a crack. Risk being real, maybe you could start with your family group, someone in your family group. It could be someone that's close to you, but that closeness has been limited because you got something hidden. Maybe you could take the next brave step and just share a secret with somebody. That's what happened with me and my friend Eric Villiami. Shared a secret. He ended up sharing his secret. And even to this very day, I haven't seen him for a long time, but we message and we see. It's just like, it's like there's, there's already this connection I have with him. Because we formed meaningful relationship based on risk being real with one another. So maybe start with a family group member. Maybe start with a friend, someone close. Pray for an opportune time that where you can risk being real. Share your concerns, share your fears, share your worries. Just risk being real with those important relationships in your life and see what God can do. My wife reminds me, sometimes I'm just too open with everybody that when you wear your heart out on the sleeve, you're more prone to be impacted by more people. But I'd rather be that person than to be one who hides, one that closes up. You know, I've walked into this room knowing that there's somebody, in the, uh, not, not, not right now, but there's been times where I've walked through this room and I've walked in one side knowing there was someone else in the room on the other side that has a grievance against me, but I still have to preach the Word of God. Do you know that I've preached the Word of God still internally, not holding anything against anybody, but having to manage what they just said to me two days before. I've actually walked through the building before and somebody has said something to me as I'm walking into the auditorium and still have to act. And I, I say act because I did act. <laughs> but I had to gather myself together and still preach the good news of the gospel, the love of God in an atmosphere where I am constantly having to work through because of a relationship. But one thing I do do, do is that I do not leave it there. I will go and try to do my best to reconcile or restore, confront what needs to be confronted and risk being real. I would rather be real and be hated upon than to keep myself bound and never knowing what true love really is. Oh, I wish I read that in my notes. So relationships is the first one. Second one is be hot. Everyone say I'm hot. honest. This is what Pastor Mike um, Todd says. Be honest, open, and transparent. That's 
That's a big value in the life of this church. Authenticity. Just being real. See, God doesn't, what I love is that God doesn't expect perfection. He just wants honesty. Isn't that beautiful? And so you can come up as your, you can come, you can come in here and come before God as the real messed up you. And he's not worried about your mess ups because he already knows about them. All he wants is just, just be honest with me when you come to me. So you can come to him real messy, but as long as you're honest. So he's not expecting you to be perfect. That was found in Jesus. He's just expecting you to be honest. You know, you're only as sick as your secrets. Secrets kill from the inside out. Now, I'm always very weary lately of saying this because every time I say it, my week's filled of whole heaps of people telling me their secrets. I was like, oh, it was my fault. <laughs> In fact, we were worshipping. Well, you guys were worshipping me and Pastor James were talking. Ready for the 11, I said, oh, it's going to be a big week. <laughs> I go, it's going to be a good week, but it's, it's going to be a big week, babe. It's going to be a big year, babe. I told her. Why? Because we're telling people to get free. And we're going to be part of that reason, part of that process to help people get free. So don't rationalize the truth. What does that mean? Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it's not as bad as Dylan. Have you ever done that before? When, when reality is like God's actually just highlighting you or someone around you is highlighting you, but the first thing you do is like, yeah, 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 but it's not as bad as their one. What they're really doing is don't put the spotlight on me. All right, go check it on them. That looks way worse. Man, we're not talking about them. God wants to deal with you don't compromise the truth what does that mean well I didn't hit the mark I didn't hit that standard that God wants me that I really want to be and I just keep falling back to here so you know I'm just going to compromise this is my level of quality of life now I'm going to compromise the truth the truth is that God wants me to live here but I only believe the strongholds and the lies and now it's my identity no no I'll compromise the truth I'll just I'll live down here where I feel a little bit more safer so that when I fail I was already here I wasn't here too many people are too afraid to live the way God's called them to live. And it's not because of God's standard is too high. It's because you're unwilling to confront. I don't want to stop blaming others. Adam, Eve did it. Oh, it was the devil. It was, it was his fault. Yeah, yeah, he lied. Yeah, he's got power, but you gave him authority. And then Adam's like, yeah, it's her fault. She gave me the, she gave me the fruit. Come on, your kids, man. I was just laughing at the 9 a.m. Man, if my boy, if you could see captions of what he was thinking, I reckon he's dobbing on his, on his, on his sister. That's not my fault, Dad. It was Psalms. She gave it to me. She put the remote in my hand. <laughs> it's amazing that we blame others real easy. Don't look at me. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. Take responsibility. To getting free. So let me give you something that we call um, a, a, um, a, a psychologist in 1955 came up with this bit of a model and it's called the Johari window. J-O-H-A-R-I. Johari window. You can look it up. And it, it is to help us kind of discover more. And it's a window. They call them windows, right? Panels of looking into our life. And we can look through each of these panels. In fact, most of us have been looking through these panels and identifying one ourselves and the world that we see. The first panel on this Johari window is the knowledge we all know. The knowledge we all know. This is the public you. This is their public you. This is their, their you that everybody saw on Facebook. You were on holiday, your highlight reels. It was all the, it's the people, when you come to church, it's the one where you, 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 you walk in here and, you go, and someone says, hey, how are you doing? And you say, yeah, I'm good. I'm, uh, it's good, it's good. When it's not good, you just like. By the way, as a pastor, when, when I ask you, how are you doing? What I was really asking is asking, oh, this is what God wants, not perfection. I'm good. God wants honesty. So even as your pastor, I say, Sif, are you okay? And you're not. 
What's required is honesty so that we can find healing and freedom. Now, I understand what it means to be brave because there are moments where you have to try to be brave for your kids, for your wife, but don't let that exclude you from not being open and honest and transparent. So this is the public you that everybody sees. It's not necessarily the real you. By the way, some of you put the real, real, real you on Facebook when you should be not. Oh, hang on, James, that just sounds contradictory. No, 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 because not everyone knows how to handle your mess. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and then you're wondering why you're spiraling down because someone commented like, get over yourself. And the reality is you probably would have heard that from someone who loves you, your trusted circle, but you couldn't receive it because you put something on and then you put something on there about your marriage and you didn't even consult with your husband and now he's been put out in public as somebody who's not a good man, but he is. He just made a mistake and you just ruined everything and you just made it even harder. Some things are just not meant to be on social media. Deal with it at your home. It's gutless when you put it on social media. It's brave when you confront it person to person. So, knowledge we all know. The second window pain window is what we know but others don't. This is the mask you. What we know about myself is those secrets that you've been masking yourself with, those secrets that you know but others don't. Then. And you're trying your best to hold all that back, but you're wondering why you can't walk in freedom is because you're holding all of this, uh, all these secrets behind and you're putting on this facade and you're wondering why you're not getting breakthrough. It's because you wear masks all day, clothing yourself with not the real you and you're holding everything internally and you're wondering why you're not healthy or living in freedom. The third pain is this. What others know, this is my favorite one. What others know that we don't know about ourselves. Oh, and all the married couples like, amen to that, brother. What does this mean? It means there are people in your world or not in your world that can see something in you that you haven't allowed in your world to show you what they see so that you can get free from what you're privately not being able to see in your blind spots. Are you with me? You got blind spots and you're wondering why I laughed with a couple after the night. I said, have you ever had that moment, guys, where you, you're, you said to your wife, you know, you really need to work on, right? And you've been saying it for what? Three months, six months, maybe even longer. Then you get to church and a visiting guest speaker comes and they're preaching the Word of God. And then they said the same thing you said six months ago. And your wife's like, oh, that's me. Oh, yes, yes, I received that. And then they come home and they share with you, man, the Lord just showed me. The Lord showed you. The Lord showed you six months ago. And he used me. You know, the beautiful thing, it's happened heaps of times, vice versa, by the way. And, it's, and, it's, and it's, the beautiful thing is that it was still revealed. But if we can position ourselves to be a person and it's hard. Anyone else find that hard? Just like, oh, sitting there. And I give you permission to. I gave it to Lucy on Saturday. Freedom groups, I said to her after, you know you have permission, eh, to disagree with, or, or you, can, you can hit me up if I kind of overstepped because I'm trying to train her up and doing it. But sometimes I'm just a buffy. I just kind of step in. And, and, and I gave her full permission. And, and some people say, but I can't do that. You're the pastor. I'm just like, look, just do it, all right? Okay, it's good for me. I don't like it, but it's good for me. That's what we need in our life. I hope you guys are getting a mean ass work, shoulder workout. But anyway, last pain, last pain. Not that kind of pain, last pain. All right, is this. Oh, actually, before we go there, come, come up, come up. Come up. Uh, Proverbs 27, verse six. I need you to look at this. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but enemy multiplies kisses. In other words, would you rather have a real friend that can help you clean up your wounds? Or would you have, a, have an enemy that just keeps sucking up to you, keeping you where you don't want to be? Get real friends. And the last one is neither we nor other people know. This is, this is where God 
comes into the play. This is where the Holy Spirit comes into play, where He helps us reveal to us what other people can't see, what you can't see. And He just says, look, hey, Clement, this is an area of your life. I, I, I was waiting for the right time. So let's just take a look at that. But it's those moments where you're just like, oh, God, oh, my goodness. You go talk to your husband. You go talk to your friends. And they're like, oh, yeah, we, we kind of, we kind of, uh, uh, we, we, were, we were sensing it as well. And, and then all of a sudden you start taking off your mask and you start sharing those secrets with people and the people around you. And then the public you becomes a more freer you. So be open, be honest, be transparent. Thanks team. And the last one, the last one in our, in our journey of getting free is the Holy Spirit. Everyone say Holy Spirit. All right, let's go for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord of the is Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, what? Freedom and liberty. Zechariah, verse 4 to 6. So he said to them, His word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. There are, there are four things I want to give to you when we're um, interacting with the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to reveal to us, to help us through this journey of getting freedom. And the first thing is remove all barriers. Remove all barriers. All barriers that are stopping you from hearing the Holy Spirit clearer. All barriers that are stopping you. Barriers like unforgiveness. Barriers like worry. And this is what King David did in Psalms 139 verse 23. He says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Uh, uh, um, what does it say? Test me and uh, know my anxious thoughts, those worries. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. If you can have that humble attitude and that relationship with the Holy Spirit, where He will search you because you gave Him permission. He's a gentle spirit. He's a gentle God. He won't go to a place that you haven't given permission to go. So when you give Him permission to go to that place, what you're saying is, I want to be free and I need the Spirit of God to get me free. Search me, Lord. How me? And this is what I'm encouraged by. Don't let the mind get in the way of the heart. Sometimes you think your way out of it. Don't let the mind get in the way of the heart. Sometimes you're trying to logically explain your life or logically get yourself to freedom when it's not by your mind, it's not by your logic, it's not by your re reasoning. It is by the Spirit of God that we get free. So don't let the mind get in the way of the heart, but don't trust your feelings more than the Word of God. Your feelings, your heart can be deceiving. So don't allow your feelings to trump the Word of God. Make the Word of God up with a heart of expectancy, with faith and saying, Holy Spirit, move in me. There were three baptisms that happened in our life. The first one was baptism into the family of God, into the church through salvation. The second baptism is the baptism of water. The third one is the one of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, right? Repent, baptism of salvation. Be baptized, baptized in water. Every one of you in the name of the Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Three baptisms that happen in your life. The second thing that you want to do in regards to how allowing the Holy Spirit to move and activate in your life and finding freedom is request the gift of the Holy Spirit. You could do that right now. Holy Spirit, I ask for the gift of your Spirit in my life right now. Fill my life. I need to go on this journey of knowing what's inside of me that's hindering me, that's stopping me. You can request the Holy Spirit right now. The second, third thing is receive the Holy Spirit by faith. I don't know that I was filled with the I, My mom would tell me that we, we get given the Holy Spirit, but I didn't still believe it. I didn't actually receive it by faith until I had this one encounter where my whole body went paralyzed after pastor prayed for me and I didn't know what was happening, but they said, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just like, uh, okay, I was paralyzed, but I was feeling good. I felt good. It was just strange. And then I went and told my mom and the mom gave me this book called Good Morning Holy Spirit. And then so I read that book and I realized that the author, Benny Hinn, um, had the same experience. And that's when I received the Holy Spirit by faith. I knew I was, I knew I was filled with with the Holy Spirit and that was when I was 12 and I haven't had an experience like that before but I just know I'm filled with the Holy Spirit I just walk around received Him by faith I know I have the Spirit of the Lord inside of me receive Him with faith this morning friend today and the last one is relate to Him daily you can talk to Him like you talk to Heavenly Father you can talk to Him like you talk to Jesus Christ 
You could talk to Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, how's it going, man? Have you woke up in the morning and said, good morning, Holy Spirit? Have you ever felt His presence come into your room and He says, what's up? And then you just relate to Him in your everyday. Holy Spirit, would you reveal in me anything right now? I didn't really like the way I talked to my wife and my kids right there or, or, or that message that I got. I just, Holy Spirit, would you just help me? And He's just going to help you, comfort you. He's going to instruct you. He's going to teach you. Relate to Him daily. But you've got to receive Him by faith and you could do that right now, today. Right now. Receive Him by faith because you're not going to get free by your works. You're not going to get free by your, by your power nor by your efforts. You're not going to get free by your intelligent mind, although you are intelligent. You're not going to get free by your logic nor reason. You're going to get free because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that's gentle, the Spirit that was power, the Spirit that's going to walk with you all the days of your life. Relate to Him daily. So Holy Spirit, right now, I ask that you would fill this room. Can I ask everybody to stand? Would you close your eyes this morning, today? <clears throat> Whether you feel like it or not, how you do it, I'm not too concerned. But if you could just open up your, your hands, maybe lift up your hands, and just wanting to be receptive of God, of the Holy Spirit, and receive Him. Maybe you'll hear this today and you haven't received the impartation of the Holy Spirit. You can believe for it right now. So, ready yourself. Tune out all the distractions. Don't worry about the distress. The depression is going to go. Just allow Spirit of God to move in your hearts. This is the start of your journey of getting freedom in your life. He wants to talk to you about relationships that you need to restore. He wants to talk to you about the relationships you need to nurture. He wants to talk to you about the ones that you may have to sever or redefine. He wants to talk to you about being open and honest. Stop wearing masks. He wants to talk to you about uh, um, including those people around you that love you so much, but you've been, you've been, you've been deferring to them. You've been deferring from them. You've been you're kind of just uh, ignoring them because they're trying to tell you the truth. You're just not ready to hear it right now. But the Lord's saying, just let my spirit give you courage and boldness to confront those things that have been hindering you, friend. So just receive Him, Holy Spirit, in your gentleness and in your power. Fill. Fill. I want you to do this. Holy Spirit, I receive you. Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me today. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your power. Holy Spirit, fill. So just ask Him, receive Him. Ask Him to gently show you things that you need to deal with, hindrances or barriers that are standing in the way, strongholds, lies that you've been leaving that have become your identity because what follows I am follows you. You are a child of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully created by your Lord, your heavenly Father. You are not dumb. You are intelligent. You are not useless. You are worthy. This is who you are. This is the truth in which you stand on. You are not useless. You are intelligent. You are more than enough. You are worthy. You are worthy to be loved. You are worthy to be cared for. You are worthy. Your identity is who He says you are. Not what the devil is like. So we break off every stronghold, Lord Father, of every lie, every deception. No more prisoners bound by deception. But set free. 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 have your attention. There's new, some next steps that we need to do. Because it's not enough just to be in this environment. There's a process that needs to be outworked. Some of you have to do what I just instructed that man just a couple of days ago. Write down the events that have negatively impacted your life, even if it's right from the child. And then when you're ready, write down the negative impacts it had on life, like guilt, shame, that, write down all those things and it's going to be hard because it's going to be revealing but the Holy Spirit will be with you get a friend to do it with you someone you trust you might want to do it as a couple 
without any judgment. And then what I want you to do is find out, Lord, is the Holy Spirit, is there anything in these events that you need me to actively go and do to restore that event or to deal with it? And then I want you to write down all the truths about every lie and every stronghold that you that has, that has uh, uh, um, uh, you've been believing over there, and then rip up all those lies, throw them in the rubbish, and then write all those truths, and then plant those truths all over your toilet, all over your bathroom, all over your all over your bedroom, all over your Bible if you read it. <clears throat> Maybe you should be boasting it all over your phone, because at least you're going to visit. It enough times maybe for some of us we need to put it on our fridge because you've been visiting it too much times well it's true I'm an emotional eater I better put all mine over there so that I don't do too many visits but it's a process what happens today is breakthrough what happens tomorrow is follow through and if you believed it over so many years, the negative things, it's not going to take 40 years like it did the Israelites. It can take you a shorter amount of time by doing what we just practiced right now. I want you to write down and walk around, I am, I am, I am, who God says I am. I am a child of God. I am intelligent. I am more than enough. Do those things. Now what else I want you to do is write down all those things important relationships that you need to nurture and go and invest in them. Pray for them. Bless them for being a blessing to you. Impact their lives. Sow into their lives. Thank them for what they had been and have been for you. Go and invest in those things. Are there people that you need to reconcile, restore, sever or redefine? Take this message please church and do something about it. I can't get everybody in freedom groups for this one. But in the second half of the year, I'm hoping we can get as many people through freedom groups as we possibly can. I can't get, I can, I can get you on the pathway of going to a sozo. Talk to our hosting today. They can give you some information. You can contact Leanne, the team, and set up for that. Sozo is a Hebrew word for healed, saved, and delivered. And it's positioning yourself just to deal with it more in an intimate setting. Go talk to your family group leader and ask them I need to get free. Talk to them. Be brave. Be honest. Okay? Your pastors can't meet with everybody. As much as I'd love to, I'd love to meet with everybody and help them on this journey. But one thing I do know is that the limitation on this church is not found in the bottleneck of your leaders. It is found in a team of people who love one another and that's us, the body of Christ. Amen. So Holy Spirit, lift your hands one more time. Receive. Only you can do this. It's not my preaching. It's not my word. It's not the music. It's not the environment. It's purely Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, walk with us in freedom. Help me be a better dad. Help me be a better husband. Help me be a better leader. Deal with any of the offensive ways in us, Lord Father. Free us from hindrances and barriers. Reveal our eyes, open us up to those things that we need to confront. Lord, bestow upon us bravery, courage, and boldness to face everything. In Jesus' mighty and precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.